This film on the F2H2 Banshee will cover taxiing, take off and climb, normal flight, maneuvers, single engine flight, approach and landing, and securing. The F2H2 taxiing or idling on both engines for one hour will burn over 280 gallons without going anywhere. Jet pilots want this fuel for flight reserve. Maneuvering on the ground, therefore, should be kept at a minimum once the engines are started. Visibility from the cockpit is very good. On flat, hard surfaces, the airplane will roll with both engines idling. With tricycle landing gear, it is safe to taxi at fairly high speeds. So, if the taxi strip is clear, let the airplane roll freely, using the brakes for steering only. The nose wheel swivels freely through 360 degrees, but is not steerable. There is no stick or rudder control at taxiing speeds. The airplane handles well in crosswinds. To save the brakes, balance the wind force with unequal engine RPM. Stay on the runway because on soft ground, the high loading on the tires lets the airplane bog down very easily. In turning, you may use the engines to help the brakes. Because of the slower jet response, you'll need to anticipate your power requirement. To save time, the takeoff checklist should be combined with taxiing. Shoulder harness locked. Wings spread and locked. For field takeoff, flaps one quarter to one half down. Controls free. Pop the speed brakes on and off. Canopy open. Trim tabs at zero. Check aileron boost switches on. And check aileron movements for full throw. Check auxiliary fuel transfer switch as desired. Test the yaw stabilizer by holding the switch in test position. Make slight S-turns when taxiing. The rudder pedal movement should be opposite to the direction of the turn. Turn the yaw stabilizer switch off and leave it off till safely airborne. Do not take off with unbalanced loads in external auxiliary fuel tanks. We have completed the takeoff checklist. When you make the turn into takeoff position, remember that with the tricycle landing gear, the airplane responds better if it is rolling before the turn is started. After the turn, taxi the airplane ahead a few feet to get the nose wheel lined up. Apply the brakes and advance the throttles. Here are the desired readings. RPM 100%. Tailpipe temperature 625 degrees to 660. Oil pressure 60 to 90 PSI. Release the brakes. The airplane will pick up speed slowly at first. The pilot has excellent visibility. There is no engine torque, so steering is no problem. There is no response to the rudder below 60 knots, so all steering is done with the brakes, which are quite responsive. Between 80 and 90 knots, a little back pressure on the control stick will lift the nose wheel off the ground. The takeoff run seems long to a reciprocating engine pilot, but seems short to pilots accustomed to other jets. The Banshee takes off at about 105 knots, and once airborne, the acceleration is rapid. Get the landing gear up and turn the yaw stabilizer on as soon as safely airborne. Hold speed in the climb below 165 knots to a safe altitude of 200 to 300 feet when you raise the flaps. As the flaps come up, the stick will automatically come back an inch or so. Hold the nose down to get the best climbing speed. For climb to altitudes, the throttle setting should be left at 100% of RPM and the climbing speed at sea level should be approximately 305 knots indicated airspeed. Climb speed should be reduced about 10 knots for each 10,000 feet of altitude. In climbs, both two engine and single engine, the use of military power saves fuel in reaching desired altitude. 
The normal flight characteristics of the aircraft are excellent. The combination of aileron boost and yaw stabilization makes for very smooth flying. The stalling speed of the airplane will vary considerably with the fuel load. With gear and flaps up, there is a natural warning consisting of an airframe buffet, three or four knots above the stall. The stall is mild and may be broken by forward stick with very little loss of altitude. Ailerons and rudder remain effective throughout the stall. In the accelerated stall, there is even more warning from airframe and elevator buffet. Aileron and rudder controls are effective. Power has little effect on the stall except for a slight decrease in the stalling speed. With gear and flaps down, there is little natural warning. An artificial warning or stick shaker has been provided for a speed approximately seven knots above the stall. The initial stall is mild with good aileron control and recovery is immediate with a small altitude loss if the stick is pushed forward. With gear and flaps down, the accelerated stall gives reasonable buffet warning. The airplane will recover immediately if stick is eased forward. With gear and flaps down, the airplane may go into a fully developed stall if proper recovery measures are not taken. The elevator buffets sharply, losing most of its effectiveness. Aileron and rudder control are lost. In some cases, the airplane will mush four or five hundred feet nose high before breaking the stall, or may roll sharply either left or right into a vertical descent requiring as much as fifteen hundred feet of altitude for recovery. Power on aggravates this fully developed stall condition. The airplane is restricted against practice spins. However, it is important to know its spin characteristics. Entry to a spin is slow. With the nose high, the airplane rolls mildly in the direction of applied rudder as the nose drops. If control forces are held, the airplane will enter a one-half to three-quarter turn spin at a moderate rate with the nose down to approximately vertical. Auto rotation then practically stops and the nose rises sharply. At this point, center controls for recovery. Let's watch a spin in slow motion. Here is the stall. Nose down and into the spin. The nose rises. Recovery should be made now. If the control forces are held to keep the plane in a spin, the nose drops steeply. This cycle continues approximately once per turn with an altitude loss of approximately 2,000 feet per turn. The nose up pitching and whipping back into the spin becomes increasingly more violent for the first two or three turns and then remains constant. If recovery occurs during the nose down part of the spin, approximately 3,000 feet of altitude will be required for recovery. In any case, recovery from normal spins is affected by centering the controls. Inverted spins are quite delayed in entry. The airplane enters with a roll in the direction of the applied rudder and the spin is slow and uniform. Recovery normal with full opposite rudder followed by back stick. Let's watch the Banshee run through her permissible maneuvers. Steep dive angles may be used without exceeding the limits of the airplane. Airspeed can easily be controlled using throttle and speed brakes. When the speed brakes are open at speeds above 0.78 Mach, there is a slight nose-up tendency which is increasingly stronger at higher speeds. Engine speed is governed so it does not increase appreciably in dives. On completing a dive, engines can be opened to military power immediately. In dives, the limit hand of the speed indicator should not be exceeded. As the airplane approaches its limiting Mach number, a mild buffet starts at the tail. In some airplanes, a very mild nose down or tuck under tendency will develop, which will become less evident as the limiting Mach number is approached. 
the elevator trim tabs should be used with caution at high speeds. The aileron roll is smoothly executed with the aileron boost system operating. Full aileron displacement is limited according to the airspeed and altitude combinations shown on the acceleration charts in the flight handbook. The airplane will not perform a satisfactory snap roll because auto rotation ceases after one quarter to one half turn. In making vertical turns, wing overs, and chandelles, the pilot is also guided by the maximum permissible acceleration according to airspeed and altitude. Loops and Immelman turns should be entered with at least 350 knots. In inverted flight, the oil supply to the engines is limited to approximately 10 seconds. Longer periods of inverted flight should not be attempted. Normal flight operations for best range and best endurance call for single engine flight. To shut down an engine in flight, throttle all the way aft. It will be necessary to trim the airplane to compensate for off-center thrust. Let the engine windmill until tailpipe temperature is below 233 degrees centigrade. Do not windmill for more than 30 minutes at engine speeds above 20% RPM. And do not windmill when air temperature is less than minus 40 degrees. Fuel off on this engine. Engine master switch off. This closes the air inlet duct door or butterfly and stops windmilling. It is important to be sure that there is no burning in the engine before you close the butterfly. The recommended low speed cruise condition is with one engine operating at normal rated power. Single engine operation at altitudes below 20,000 feet will result in increased range and endurance. The best air starts can be made below 25,000 feet. If above 25,000 feet, windmilling RPM must not exceed 16% RPM prior to light off. Indicated airspeed should be approximately 200 knots. With the dead engine throttle in the off position, turn the engine master switch on to open the air inlet duct door. As the engine begins to windmill and reaches 12 to 16% RPM, turn the fuel on. Start igniting and ease the throttle forward opposite the idle slot. When light off is obtained, use the throttle during acceleration to control the tailpipe temperature. The approach letdown is best made with engines throttled back and speed brakes extended, losing altitude between 200 to 250 knots indicated airspeed. Avoid prolonged engine operation between 68 to 76 percent RPM because of critical stresses in the compressor. The nose will be well down, giving the pilot good visibility of the traffic and area below. At pattern altitude, you'll want at least 500 pounds of fuel aboard to give a margin of safety for a possible wave off. Enter the pattern with engines throttled back. Speed brakes out and speed approximately 200 knots indicated airspeed. Shoulder harness locked and armament switches off. Let's look at the overall pattern for approach in the Banshee. Enter the pattern with engines throttled back, speed brakes out and at the landing pattern altitude. Enter the downwind leg and at 174 knots, lower the landing gear. As the airplane slows down below 165 knots, lower the flaps. There will be very little trim change because of the flap-operated bungee, which moves the stick ahead as flaps go down. Retract the speed brakes immediately and hold about 125 knots on the downwind leg. The speed on the base leg is 120 knots. On the final approach, when you are sure you can make the runway, retard the throttles to idle and with normal landing load conditions, come over the end of the runway at 110 knots. Let's follow through on the approach and checklist. We enter the pattern with engines throttled back using the speed brakes to slow down. Into the downwind leg and at 174 knots, landing gear down. At 165 knots, flaps down, speed brakes closed. Canopy open. 
double check landing gear indicators down. Finish the downwind leg at 125 knots, slowing to 120 knots on the base leg, over the end of the runway at 110 knots. Set the yaw stabilizer switch to off position immediately prior to touchdown. In the final approach, the airplane is flown to the ground with the tail down, but not in a stall landing attitude. After touchdown, use the speed brakes to slow down. When you know you are down to stay, move the stick back to hold the nose up as long as possible. As the elevators lose their grip, the nose will rock over gently to the three-point attitude. Then brakes can be used strongly and evenly to control the landing run. In a crosswind landing, normal landing technique is used. On the tricycle landing gear, the airplane will roll straight with a minimum of rudder and brake steering. As a carrier aircraft, the Banshee has proved itself. The pilot will find, however, that his responsibilities do not cease when he gets the cut. The airplane must be controlled in speed, attitude, and position all the way through to the rollback of the arresting gear. In the event of a wave off or incomplete landing attempt, advance the throttle smoothly to 100% RPM and climb at 115 knots indicated airspeed. Immediately retract the landing gear. At a safe altitude, raise the flaps and fly in the clean condition until ready to attempt another landing. About 240 pounds of fuel are required for an immediate go around. In securing the aircraft after flight, chocks should be placed fore and aft of the main wheels and inlet screens installed. To shut down the engines, advance engine speed to 60% momentarily, then move the throttles to the off position. Make sure throttles are all the way aft. Fuel off both engines. Master radio switch off. Battery generator switch off. Aileron boost off. Engine master switches off. This procedure will leave the duct doors open. After the engines have cooled for several minutes, put the battery generator switch in battery generator position and when duct doors have closed, return switch to off. Air inlet duct guards should be inserted and the airplane tied down. In this film, you have seen how the Banshee is handled in taxiing and flight. Reference to your flight handbook will help you perfect your understanding of this airplane.